This is... Wow! What, what a week. What a week. Politics. Politics. So here's a little insight on our, well, our insider, our Minister of Interpretation. Butsang, welcome, brother man. Yeah, thank you, and, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, a celebrity, I wish one day I reach that status. You know, I always watch your show with all the celebrities, yes, and sir. I'm like, wow, uh, people have interesting lives. Mm -hmm. Raised on the West Rand of Johannesburg. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, take us back to what is now Mokhali City. Well, I was, I was actually born in Mokhali City. Yes. Uh, to be exact, the hospital that used to be called Paradekral Hospital, mm. it is now called Dr. Yusuf Dadu oh, yes, yes, Hospital, yes, yes, yes. which is in Mokali City, the former Kruger's Dorp. While my parents actually, I'm coming from Ranfontein, you know, mm. in Mutakin, that sure. street. The reason I was born there actually, in a, in a white people hospital with privileges, is because of my grandmother, who was what they used to call kitchen mates or ah. helper, worked on a family that had arranged that my mother, who was 19 years old to give birth uh, uh, you know at a, at a, at a hospital with, sure. with, with you know better facilities mm. uh, uh, but I grew up in Ranfontein sure. you know, uh, you know I, I always tell people Kasia Mosaki has, has produced the superstars of South mm. Africa, the Ace sure. Twillings, the Ben Claudis, mm. the Terra Matibulas Boban Piri and Boza Mwila at and the Boza end, Mwila. I yes, always sir. say that Who is Pule? Tell us about Pule Bule, Bule is my brother, yeah. my cousin. Uh, we grew up in one house, mm. actually, uh, because my parents, I think, they only had our own home sure. around 1976, mm. if, if I'm not mistaken. And I grew up in, with Bule, we were in one house, mm. uh, you know, sure. uh, the brother to my father. So Bule is basically my elder brother. So Bule, when you are four, in 1976, is starts grade one yes because he's two years older than me yes yes but where now uh, because uh, also hello papa <laughs> insist i also want to go to school well i, I you know you know fresh i vividly recall yeah. uh, my first day at school uh, uh, in 1976 during grade one mm. but basically what happened and the storyline is i cried so much that Buddha was leaving me home yes to go to start school and and that uh, i forced to go to school and and you know the story i'm getting is that my dad mm. uh, my mom said to my dad do something about it and my yeah. dad said give me that child i'll show you what i'll do with this i'll stop him from crying and and that's how i started school but the, the story line is when my dad took me to school he called the principal on the side mm. and the, the teacher and said look he's fine no he doesn't qualify but just make life a living hell for him today sure. at school that mm. he must cry you know, to come back home. Mm. That never happened. The rebel in me started at that time. In fact, I'm told that despite the fact that you are not officially a student, you were top of the class that year. I, I still have my substandard A. That's what they call grade yes, one. Yes, 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 my yes. mom kept all our school reports. Mm, no, mm. I still have my substandard A. Yes. Grade one mm. report. Mm. I came out number one, H4. I was number one of the class, <laughs> unregistered. <laughs> so they, they were literally stuck with me now. Now I'm the best performer in class. Yes. I'm unregistered. Mm. And the school principal at that time, and my school teacher, you know, may his soul rest in peace, uh, Masim, Masim, you know, said, I'm not losing this child. Mm. And mm. yeah, that's how my, you know, uh, academic or school year started. When did your conscientization happen in terms of what's happening in this unjust society that you're growing up in? Look, do you, re I, do you remember the point? I, 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 I think mm. it happened after my dad had a house, mm. and it was in the in the late seventies, probably age eight, nine, and ten. Mm. And 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 the reason is there was too much movement at home. We grew up in a three room house, not mm. three bedroom, mm. kitchen, living room, and the parents' bedroom. Mm. But there was too many movement in the house. So then I just, first I. Started thought it was church people because mm. my dad was an elder of the church but then i realized no these are not people i see in church it was other people mm. and only to find out that my father was a, an activist in a civic movement mm. and so the people who were frequenting home especially in the late 70s yeah. were political activists ah, yes. and, 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 and they are now living in a two room house and we are sitting in the kitchen and they're in the living room or they're sitting in the kitchen we're in the living room 
my ear was not glued. I don't even think we had TV at that time. Yeah, you listened to Bound to I, Radio. I, I, I was listening. They would switch off the radio in yeah. order for them to talk. Sure. And, uh, and I, I hear things that, you know, they probably thought he's too young to can and understand mm. this. That's when I actually my eyes got open mm. regarding politics and things like that. Uh, and I started paying attention mm. and I discovered that actually my dad is a civil you know, society leader, he's mm. a Pan-Africanist. Then I started asking him questions later in life. Mm. I can tell you that by age 12, I was actually, I, I remember, you see, at home being the royal family is that when you reach age 12, which is age of puberty, mm. You are given rules and regulations. Sure. You know, in the rural areas, you'll be taken to the mountain to mm -hmm. be groomed to become a boy. Yes. And and one of the things that my parents instilled on me was uh, my gift at age 12 was two packer pens, a pen and a pencil. Mm -hmm. And I still have the note today that my oh, dad wow. wrote to me to say, mm -hmm. Uh, my son, these things are not pens. Mm. These are weapons oh, wow. of war. Yes. Use them wise. I had those pens for over 20 years. Oh, it wow. was a pack set, very yes. expensive pack yes. set. And I still have the letter. So, so for me, it, he was preparing me. Mm. And then I started writing. You know, mm. At age 12, I had a gift set of two pack pens. Yeah. I started writing. Do you remember what you were writing at the time? Mostly it was cool things. Yeah. Mostly, uh, I like poetry when mm. I go up. I, I will mm. write a lot of poems. And it was not in politics. Yeah. I, I actually started writing politics around age 14, 15. Mm. Uh, you, know, you know, Fresh, at age 16, mm. and I googled it, it's still there, my first newspaper article, I was under a code name, Moafrika Port. Oh, wow. And sometimes I will use what I used in politics, Obrimo Sekhe. So, Moafrika Porto, Butza Muilwa, Obrimo Sekhe is the same person. Oh, wow. My first article, I was 16 years of old. So, this would have been 1988, 89? Yes, it yes. was, exactly. Yes. It was in the Sowetan. It was, it was actually immediately after uh, the formation of PASO, the Pan Africanist Student Organization, yes. in 1988. Mm. I wrote my first article to the Soweten yeah. at that time, but under a code name. Yeah. And, and in that instance, we, 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 you know, I was exposed to writing. So writing has been in me. It's been your thing. Has been my thing. And it was into the Soweten. But also in high school, you were a bit of a rebel. And, well, and, and, and I, I, I'm told you missed a year of school because you're a rebel. Well, actually, I, I didn't really miss a year at school. You yeah. know, it was those years, the year we spoke about it in one of our past shows. Yes. I did not write my standard nine exams mm, mm. Uh, that particular year uh, because I left the country for, I was an activist. Yes. It actually started first in 1985 it was okay. called the international youth year yes where you know students we revolted all over we became the, the 76 youth mm. of the 80s and the high school i was attending to ab pukumpe senior secondary mm. it was a very notorious school with rebellions and all that and i was one of the youngest so so it started there the growing the activism but when i was already doing standard nine which is grade one grade yeah. 11 today yeah. Just before exams, mm. around, which, which normally they would start in November, yeah. around, it was one, one year mm. after, 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 you know, uh, uh, we moved to a new building, a new school. And, and around, I think, July, August, July, mm. we, 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 we started, you know, uh, f uh, celebrating the one year existence ah, yes. of the Pan African Student Organization. Mm. Mm. So instead of going to an annual congress of the student organization, I end up in a military camp. Uh, briefly, as briefly as possible. Take us through your days in exile. As a child, I mean, you're a child, you're getting military training, you're outside the country. Literally, I don't like the word exile because I didn't skip the country's yes. others. We left mm. briefly. We, yeah. we, 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 and I've said to people before, we end up in the Transkei Defense Force mm. military camps under, you know, uh, Major General Bantolomisa at that time. And he facilitated us leaving the country. Mm. Uh, some went to MK camps, some to Azanla camps in Botswana, and some of us, we end up in Zimbabwe and Tanzania mm. in the Apla military camp. So it was what they used to call a bridging course on using using arms and ammunition. Sure. So it didn't like you go for military training for six months or what. It lasted a mm -hmm. couple of number of weeks and then we had to come into the country mm -hmm. unarmed. The arms would find us in the country or we'll find them in the country. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a short course in using 
uh, arms, and it was basically an AK-47, a Scorpion machine gun, which was notorious with APLA, mm -hmm. and a hand grenade, and sure. a pistol. So mm -hmm. basically it was that, then we'll come back into the country. At that stage, were you willing to put your life on the line for the country? The, 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 the fact that I had run away from home, mm -hmm. abandoned family, abandoned school, mm -hmm. and end up in a military camp, it, it's a clear sign that I was yeah. prepared to put my, my life on line. Did you ever have to use your training? Several times. It, it happened several times. Yeah. Actually, you know, uh, uh, two weeks ago, I drove a friend to Naledi. Mm. And, and then I discovered that the road uh, that passes Chris uh, mm. Hani Baragwana mm. Hospital mm. is closed, it's under construction. Yeah. So we had to take some roads and pass Moletani mm. and Tadi. Mm. And I passed a place where I once had a military operation. Uh, there used to be a so 52 what, what battalion. So this, what this is was now this? 19. 1990, 1991, okay. 1990, 1991. Okay, so you're 19, 18, 19, 20. I was, no, old. no, not even 20. I was, I was 17. You're 17? Yes. Okay. I was 17. So that would probably be about 89, 90. Then. 89, 90, yeah. yeah. I actually, it was in, in uh, the year of the Great Storm, 1990. Sure. You know. So there was a military barrack in Tladi. Mm -hmm. And it was the 52 Battalion South African Defenses Military Barrack. And one of the operations I was involved with, mm. you see, I thought APLA forces were mad, and I still think we were, we were crazy, because it was not planting bombs. Sure. The three of us, we walked mm. armed into that military barrack, and we attacked soldiers. That, that's one of the operations I was involved with. But I was the youngest of, of the, the other guys were two years older than me. Yeah. So all I needed to do was to carry a sidearm. A sidearm is what you call a pistol. Yes. And them with machine guns. Scorpion is a very small submachine mm. gun. You know, right? They walked in there. So I had to throw a grenade and wait at the gate mm. to cover them when they come out running mm. after executing the mission. Jump into the car, none of us was caught. Disappeared into the back so, side of the so, so you're driving to these barracks? Yeah, I'm a passenger. We are four. There's a driver yeah. and three operators. You guys are driving to these barracks. You're still a child. Yeah. Well, I'm no, you're, you're a child. You're a child. And you guys are driving there. What's going through your head at that stage? That I may come out not alive. That I may mm. be killed. Mm. That we may find the soldiers ready at the gate. Yes. We won't even enter. And so, so the two other operatives, the, the, the strategy was very clear. Mm. The two other, you go in there, you, you know, you're not suspected. You are yeah. tiny, you are little, you are boots, and you're not. You're throwing a grenade to the four soldiers at the gate. As they go mad, the other guys walk in, start shooting randomly, come out running. The driver is sitting in the car. Mm. The driver is not a guerrilla. He's not from exile. He's not trained. Mm. He is a getaway vehicle. Mm. Drive it somewhere, abandon everything except weapons. Mm. Abandon everything. I didn't have to use the side pistol mm. because they caught the soldiers off guard. And when they came out running, they were not you under didn't, You didn't need to cover them. You I didn't need to cover them. To cover them. Yeah. We drove in. Drop the car. I didn't know so way to that time, but I know I was in the middle of so way to. We had other people who took us, drove us to other places. Mm. And you know, that was one of, but that was the most dangerous mm. operation I've, I've ever been in. But I'm told one of the things about, it was APLA, right? Yes. Is the fact that often a lot of your operations succeeded because the cells were always small. The, the numbers. The numbers. It was yeah. always me and someone else. Yeah. So there is less of a chance that there'll be a snitch. How true is that? What that is very true. Yeah. Whoever informed you that what, how APLA was formed, we were influenced by mm. the Hamas and the Palestinian and the the the, the you know rebel military movement yes. in, in Sinn Fein. Yeah. In in that. So the, the idea was the smaller you are in a cell, mm. the lesser the numbers you are, the, the lesser the risk of being caught. Yes. We were never more than three. Mm. We were never five or ten people in, mm. in one operation. Mm. There may be other people involved sitting somewhere, but those who are carrying the operation had to be three people. Mm. And these three people who go and carry out an operation and you split. But you know, uh, 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 the former uh, PAC chairperson and who was the commander in chief of APLA, yeah. uh, Johnson Malambo, we, sure. we used to call him Chairman River. Mm. He, he, he used to say something, I'm sending you the throw of you out. Mm. I'm sending you out, you come back the throw of you. Even if one is a corpse, yeah. you do not leave a trace behind. If you are in including a situation, your body. Including, including your the body. body. Yeah. If you are in a situation whereby you cannot carry the body, it's fine. But should you carry the body, you know, you yes. must cover your tracks. Mm. Just take the body with. 
and and I know one set operation I was involved in. Uh, we had to leave the body. You know, one mm. of the guys we had an operation in Pretoria East, mm. uh, and 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 we had to leave the guy in the so car. So what was that operation in Pretoria? Uh, fundraising. Mm. It was another operation, and and we were going to, for fundraising. Mm. You call it arm robbery today. The liberation movement needed money and yes, all those things. Yes. And as we approach that area. And I heard somebody talking about it who was a cop mm. at that time. And, and I'm like, oh gosh, now in recent years. Yes. And as we were driving there, I think the police got a tip. Ah, yes. Again, we are four. I'm at the back seat with this guy. There's a driver and another guy in front. And uh, we're driving at Toyota Cressida. Mm. And, and the guy who was driving said, look, I can leave them. They're in a buggy. Mm. But the guy I'm sitting with at the back is insisting that we've got an opportunity. We need money. We won't have anywhere to move. Chief, I'm telling you, this guy opened the door of the car because they started the sirens and to stop us. He opened the door of the car. Now, mm. four black men in a Cressida. Mm. Cressida is an expensive vehicle at yep. that time. Mm. He opened, as the car is moving, the place is called, the street these days is called, uh, 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 I think, Genoa Masdel or something mm. like that. He opened the door of the car as it's driving. Mm. He, uh, you know, laid down and took out his arm and started shooting at the cops as we were driving. Yeah. We couldn't shoot back. We were scared and they started shooting back at us. Mm. Drove the car into, you know, Pretoria East suburbs mm. and all that. Abandoned the car with everything. Mm. And sadly, you know, uh, Bongani was killed. Mm. And, and that was the closest mm. to death I've ever been. Yeah. But I don't like to remember those days. Uh, you know, sometimes when you think of people laid their lives for this country and we look at what is happening today, mm, it's a mm. sad state of affairs. Sure. Let's fast forward to 1990, February. Uh, you are 18 years old. Madiba is coming out of prison. Well, I, I, do, do you remember where you were, what was going through your head at the time? I, I remember. I remember vividly. Yeah. I, I remember the, the, the February, 11th of February, yeah. 1990. And I remember seeing UDF leaders that I knew in the mm. community marching and toy toying and celebrating. But I'm a Pan Africanist, so mm. it meant nothing to me. Mm. Oh, and, and Mandela came out, and, and, and people are. And, and we were conflicted. We yeah. were caught up in a situation. Mm. We had just you know, being trained and being told Sabel Palmer, the mm. APLA commander at that time, mm. is launching Operation Great Storm. So, which meant we must intensify the armed struggle towards sure. the white settler regime. Mm. That's where we were. And now suddenly, there is this Madiba coming out of prison, and, and, and MK is laying down its arms, and we're being dragged into that whole place. So I was very unhappy. Mm. But I was living in the clandestine. I was reserved, quiet, because I did not know sure. that people should know mm. that I am politically active. Yes. I remember sitting in my yard, watering the garden, seeing people excited about it. So I was dealing with a situation here mm. Uh, mm. to say, I know there's arms somewhere. I'm supposed to be using them and fighting and going to school because yes. I was a student yes, 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 at yes. the time. I think in 1990, I was doing my first year mm. at tertiary mm. and, and, and I had to be seen as this young, dull, boring boy mm. who is a nerd who likes books. So it didn't mean that much to me. And did, we, did, did you ever feel like you are uh, Superman? That during the day you're wearing your spectacles, your study, but at night you're like Superman with a... <laughs> not, not really Superman, but there was a saying in the country that yeah. was going to say, uh, uh, Passover by day, which yes. student, and apply by night. Oh, yes. And as then, there was yes. that slogan, the Passover by day, apply by night. The PAC mm. uh, insisted on us going to school a sure. lot. Mm. And they, we thought they wanted us to get educated. But mm. I can tell you, it was also a strategy mm. to say, never be seen as an idling young black man. Yes. That's a strategy, that's a military strategy to say, go to school, be boring, have homeworks mm. and your assignment, mm. time for operations. You are somebody else. Sure, sure, sure. So you were doing first year at the time, like you said. Yes. So what did you graduate as? Uh, I, I, I graduated, and I always tell people, that's my most important qualification. Yeah. I'm a public administrator. I was sure. studying public administration. Mm. And that's what led me to government. Sure. That was not my plan. Mm. My plan was to go study and be a lawyer. I was mm. accepted at the University of Fort Hare. Sure. I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm. My parents did not have money to take me to Fort Hare. Mm. So I had to study with the, the now University of South Africa and a correspondence. It was cheaper, affordable. So I ended up studying public administration. Mm. 
Now, when, when I was doing my third year, mm. and this is, this is very important for my life, you know, uh, the country was already in the condenser negotiation sure. process. Mm. Mm. I was one of the rebels within the PAC who was against the condenser negotiations. Mm. I, I vividly recall actually uh, uh, the uh, advocate then, the Kamo Seneke, the chief the former deputy chief justice was the deputy president of the PAC. Mm. And the people like the late uh, Kwesan X, Benny Alexander, mm. they tried to calm us down to say, your commanders sitting in Dar es Salaam and, 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 and Harare mm. are saying you must listen to us in the country mm. and you are going to listen to us. So we were rebelling against that process. We wanted to only hear Johnson Malambo, the river, or Sabel Palmer telling us, put these things down. Okay? Sure. During that whole process, the, the most radical PAC leaders get killed. Mm. Jafta Kalabi Masemola, the longest serving political prisoner this country has ever had in Northern Ireland, mm. get killed in a freak car accident. Mm. Sabel Opama, the commander in chief of APLA forces, get killed in a car accident between uh, Tanzania and Hawaii. You understand? So, mm. so, so now our things are getting worse and we are getting more angry. But then during that time, mm. The PAC entered the negotiations. Yeah. So we were calmed down. Uh, you know, Advocate Kamo Seneke or Chief Justice Kamo Seneke was in the forefront and said, guys, wait a little bit. Mm. We are putting the arms struggle aside. Sure. Let, us, let us get into these negotiations. And then I decided, okay, the struggle is even abandoned. Let mm. me also start looking for a job. The then Department of Foreign Affairs mm. under Peg Velum Buota, yeah. Peg Buota advertises in the city press a post mm. to join foreign affairs. And I look at it, and they wanted people with public administration ah, yes. and communication mm. science. Exactly what I was studying, but I'm doing the last year. And then I took that, and I showed it guess to who? To mm. Kata Seleka, yes. the former PAC Deputy Secretary General. Mm. And he said to me, Mfanagit, put this through. Yeah. Put your application through. And that's what I did. And that's how I ended up in foreign affairs. But guess what? Mm. They pressed buttons. Mm. The PAC deployed me into the racist apartheid government as a spy. Now, how old I am? I'm 20. Wow. At the age of 20, mm. 1st of March 1993, yeah. so I served the apartheid government. Mm. 1st of March 1993, I joined the then Department of Foreign Affairs and Information. Mm. Guess as what? Reprographic service officer. My duty was to make photocopies. Oh, wow. Strategic position. Yeah. So every document classified, I, was, I had a security clearance, classified, I would operate a machine that was making trips mm. of ministers and meetings where and what. That's what the PAC wanted. Mm. They wanted to know which minister is traveling where, what time and all that. Mm. And imagine, I end up in that job. How in danger were you in that job? I, I, I was not. Look, the, the, uh, people thought that the apartheid government was the best. Yeah. Remember, there's not a military operation yeah. now. And nobody knew that I come from APLA, you know, mm. camps. And there's no guns, there's yeah. nothing. I'm just a young boy who's studying public administration. Embedded, making photocopies. Making photocopies, <laughs> boring and sitting there in the corner. And I don't talk. Yeah. I don't tell anybody anything mm. about that. I'm quiet, I'm looking like a photocopy machine operator, mm. completed my final year, and uh, yeah, this became that. Yeah, the rest is in my biography, and if, if people want to read what happened after, you know, I've captured it in the book. That's why at a young age I wrote a, I wrote a biography. Tell us about your biography. What is it called? Well, a uh, life with a question mark, a uh, 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 life with a rebel. I must say, why life with a question mark? Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting story, quickly. When I became a diplomat, mm -hmm. my first assignment was to Germany. I was the vice consul of South Africa to Germany and at what, age 24. What year is this? Age 24. This was 1996. Yes. So 1995, we were in a democratic South Africa. Nelson Mandela is the president. I go for diplomatic training. But how at odds are you with what you need to do versus what you felt about the negotiated settlement? I, I, I still say I surprised myself yes. how I managed to switch from being a Pan-Africanist yeah. who is saving the government of the day, the government of Nelson Mandela and the ANC. Mm. So I, I, I actually could draw a line mm. between being 
an activist or a guerrilla mm. and an employee of the government of the day. That's why, you know, to this modern day age, I always tell people, I'm a public administrator. Yes. I was sitting in a government office to do government work. Mm. And guess what? I'm surrounded by former apartheid employees, yes. Africaners, and guess my black brothers who are from the ANC. Mm. Everybody around me was mm. from the ANC. The, sure. the, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Information, we were at that time in the early 90s in administration, less than 10 black people. Mm. I was the only one mm. who came from the PAC sure. at the time. But I managed to, to contain myself mm. and to work. Because for me, it was about the country. Mm. It, was, it was not about where, which political party do you come from. Mm. It was about the country. And I managed to you know, swim over that and focus on doing the job and the assignments that were given. And the reward became what? The mm. state and tr trusted me mm. with a diplomatic training mm. to do what? Not politics. Yes. To become a head of administration and finance and consular services. Now, those are the most important mm. you know, elements. Now, you trust somebody who doesn't come from the ANC with money. Yes. Uh, in dollars and, and German marks with, with consular services, mm -hmm. you know, registering human life. And at age 24, you become a vice consul. Did that feel almost like an olive branch, given how a lot of pan Africanists were not happy with everything that happened between 1990 and 94? Yes. Where a lot of pan Africanists felt like, why are we being treated like we're never part of? the fight for independence i, I can for tell liberation. you I, I can tell you that and was part let, of let, let me finish the question and did you at any stage feel like maybe you are selling out now no i don't think so yeah. i don't think I, I i've never felt like i'm selling out because first of all remember i had said earlier on the yeah. pac the pan african mm. congress of azania they knew where i was and what i was doing sure. and there were a number remember the pc had now joined the negotiation mm. process mm. there were a number of pan africanists who served in government in various roles sure. Sure. you understand and 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 so i didn't feel like it was a betrayal mm. but also there was this thing of saying let us watch mavarara sure. you know mavarara meaning the chatterists yes. remember we are the zimzims they are the chatterists mm. let us be there be in sight influence the info the situation and watch that they are doing what the liberation movement was intended to do mm. so the, the PAC didn't become hostile mm. to the ANC mm. uh, that's why most and, and most of PAC members who went into government I don't even know one person from PAC who went in who failed most excelled mm. in what they were doing you so, know uh, for us it was saving the government of the day mm, mm. so you go to Germany you yeah. are 24 no, I was 24 years. Yeah, 24. Yes. Got married, had a child, moved to Germany. So everything is happening like this. You know, you know, fresh. Uh, talk to us about the pressure and keeping up with that pressure. Yeah, I, 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 I sometimes sit down and I read. I've read my biography six times. Yes. And every time I read it, I find something very amusing mm. about myself. Sure. That at age 21, where every parent throws in a 21st birthday party yeah. for their kids. I was already earning a salary. Sure. I started working at age 20. Mm. I threw in my own 21st birthday celebration. Mm. That's one. Sure. I'm still having arms. I'm still having my scorpion yes. and, and my firearms and all that. I then start having you know, a formal relationship, mm. meet a woman. Then I want a child. Then I when I'm in the middle of that, I'm nominated to go for diplomatic training. Mm. I actually, on, on, on record, mm. was the first black person mm. in South Africa to be trained as head of corporate services abroad. Oh, wow. Mm. At 23, because yeah. I became a diplomat at 24. Yeah. So then I, I, there was too much pressure. Mm. You understand? I left home. I was living in Atrechville. Sure. I, I, when I did my diplomatic training, I was staying in, in social group, actually. Mm. And, and then there's this woman next, next to me as well. Then suddenly there's a baby. Mm. Then suddenly I have to leave the country. <laughs> and that caused a storm in my family. Yeah. Because I said to my family, I'm getting married. And mm. everyone was like, are you mad? Yeah. How do you get married? And I'm, I'm 23. Yeah. We are getting married because we have a child. No, 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 no. I'm getting married because I have a woman I love. Mm. And we have a child. And I'm going abroad. I'm not leaving my family behind. Yes. You know, that delayed my posting. 
I was supposed to have left the country in January 1996 to mm. Frankfurt, Germany. Sure. Because of the infighting of me wanting to get married and mm. all that, and the mm. family saying that, I'm like, I'm not leaving sure. my family. So I was even prepared to sacrifice my diplomatic career, this time not for liberation mm. or for fighting, but for, for love. This thing called love. In fact, we're going to hold it there. Okay. And we'll talk about the rest in part two of our Butza, Butza, Butza interview. No, we, we can do that. Uh, okay. When we do our part two, we'll talk about his setting up uh, a mission in Rwanda. After the world ignored Rwanda and people were massacred in Rwanda, this was one of the first men that was sent to Rwanda to set up a diplomatic office there. We'll talk about your run-in with uh, the office of President Mbeki. Okay. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about marriage. We'll talk about divorce. We'll talk about how customary law let him down in his marriage, in his opinion. We'll talk about um, the paradox that he is. He's a Buddhist, but collects guns and swords, <laughs> and is a brown belt. No, 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 I'm actually a black belt. I'm oh, so you made it belt. to black? Yeah, well, when I was in Germany, I got my first black belt. I've got my first then black belt in Shotokan. Yo! It's not only guns and knives. Yes. I execute Kakato Geris as well. All of that and Mawashi Gerries and my Gerries and every other Gerry in part two of Boza Bozang. Hopefully, you enjoyed part one. This is. Wow! What, what, what a week. What a week. And that was our special segment with our special guest for the week, Bozang Muilwa. Don't forget the book is available Life with a Question Mark, self published. Find him on social media. And when we do part two, find out why this book cost him his job. Shout out to Amped Studios for hosting us, Africa Podcast Network. Uh, we are family. I've got all my brothers and sisters with me. Pezulu Works, love your cinematography. Our audio engineer, artist, the flow, Fraser. Creative director, Kuvesh Mohan. Show producer, Gilles Omudisa King. Email waw at africapodcastnetwork.com. Have a great week in spite of yourselves.